Epicurus, 341 to 270 BC. So Epicurus was a Greek philosopher, um, and he's the founder of Epicureanism, which is named after him, which we'll talk about. Now, his actual philosophy was to try to have a happy life, a calm, peaceful, tranquil life. And how are you going to do that? It's going to have an absence of pain and fear. So far, this sounds pretty good. And we're going to do this through cultivating a friendship, of having great friendships, of having freedom, and analyzing our life. So that's uh, the unexamined life that uh, Socrates spoke of. It was one of the first, if not the first, major why worry sort of philosophy. No stress, no worries. And it talked about enjoying the little things. Today, the um, movement towards, um, I forgot what it's called. Minimalism was the word I was looking for, uh, Epicurus, and enjoying the simple things in life. I like this quote from Epicurus. Let no one be slow to seek wisdom when he is young, nor weary in the search of it when he has grown old. For no age is too early or too late for the health of the soul. Um, I think this is so true. I had a, I had a former colleague come into my room um, and ask what class I was teaching. And when I told them philosophy... They said something along the lines of philosophy here. Basically, it was a shocked expression as if it's shocking that uh, the concepts of philosophy should somehow not be taught in that school. Um, I think really a lot of the concepts that Epicurus goes over are concepts that if applied would lead to a much happier life. Pleasure and pain. Epicurus is known for hedonism, which is something you may have heard. Hedonism is just saying pleasure is number one. It's the essential value. I'm not talking about, you know, pleasure. I'm talking about anything that brings happiness. Uh, they sometimes say you're a hedonist if you're into sun, surfing, just having a grand old time your whole life. Here's what Epicurus believed. He thought there was a difference between good and bad, and it comes from the sensations of pleasure and pain. In other words, anything that causes pain is something you don't want. It's something that's bad. He's not reinventing the wheel. But when you really break it down, we have to think about the things that we do. Do they cause pleasure or pain? We can calculate the benefits and the costs of any behavior. In other words, um, maybe you're going to get a great adrenaline rush from jumping off the building. That's a benefit. But you're going to splat. That's the cost. Probably uh, risk risk reward not good but he said we can calculate on pleasure and pain and as a hedonist we need to try to maximize our pleasure in, in addition to maximizing the pleasure that's the part that people talk about he really emphasized minimizing the harm taking away the pain and one way of doing that is realizing about how overindulgence can lead to our pain in other words, let's say uh, the things that make you happy is um, you love eating cake. Well, you know what? If you eat a lot of cake, the overindulgence is going to cause you long-term pain. Or if you're a hopeless romantic and you fall in love with everybody you meet, that's going to cause you long-term pain. He thought we really need to examine that something that causes pleasure in excess can actually lead to pain. Now... Moderation, Aristotle brought the moderation, the golden mean as well, Buddha as well. The trick is you got to figure out the pleasures that you can have that don't lead to pain. And what pleasures have no strings attached? In other words, they're not going to have a negative effect to them. Um, you could say exercise. Now, could you exercise too much? Hypothetically, yes. But if, if you're enjoying exercise that's a pleasure now if you're actually getting shin splints and you're walking around crooked you've done a little bit too much that's the overindulgence he said we need to analyze and be aware of these things we must therefore pursue the things that make for happiness seeing that when happiness is present we have everything but when it's absent we do everything to possess it now a lot of these quotes in regards to happiness um, and it's true. I mean, happiness is what everybody searches for everywhere. But Epicurus realized that happiness comes when we actually minimize the pain. We foolishly cause pain while we search for happiness. 
So here's the classic image of Epicurus. He's kicking back. He's got his wine. Somebody's feeding him grapes. He's enjoying life. In fact, an Epicurean is somebody who really enjoys food. They're a foodie. And there's nothing wrong with that. They indulge in the great things in life. But the, ir the irony is he wasn't about that at all. Here's a quote from Epicurus. Luxurious food and drinks in no way protect you from harm. Wealth beyond what is natural is no more use than an overflowing container. Real value is not generated by theaters and baths, perfumes or ointments, but by philosophy. Well, that's not exciting. Everybody thought Epicurus was kicking back with some fine wine, some good food, some, some perfumes and ointments. But no, he's actually saying it's philosophy is what we need to get. So what philosophy was he trying to get across? We will further examine. Ataroxia, peace of mind. I have to admit, this misconception about Epicurus is just odd. It shows him as being like the king of pleasure, maximize pleasure, be a hedonist. But actually his main call was to try to reduce the pain and suffering. When we do not suffer pain, we don't need pleasure as much. Now, this is a bad, uh, hard thing to take, but it's the seesaw. If you're really, really sad, you need to be cheered up. But if you're, just, if you're good, if you're in a good mood, you don't need to be cheered up. It's a weird up and down yo-yo sort of existence for some. And what Epicurus realized, if I can reduce the pain, I don't need as much happy to make me happy. He felt ataroxia, which is peace of mind, was the goal of life. Perfect mental peace. Nothing to worry about. No worries. No stress. Not bothered by anything. Now, I haven't had that time too many times, but I actually remember the first day I graduated from college, kicking back in a recliner, watching a baseball game, and thinking, I don't have to do anything. And that lasted a couple of days, and now we're 25 years later. Peace of mind. He said peace of mind is one of the most, if not the most important goal. To me, it's the most important goal for us as well. People, I ask people what they want, and they say, I want money. Well, money you want because money is going to bring you happiness, correct? Money is going to bring you experiences, correct? But really what money is going to bring you is hopefully not having to worry about bills. And, and the idea is... Peace of mind is what people continue to chase for, even when they have money. What he thought, it, the way to do it, instead of piling on the positives, the pleasure, if we can be content with the little things, the simple things, because if you have a lot, it's going to be hard to keep that. It's going to be hard to keep up on the upkeep of your new mansion. Unnecessary desires are going to produce unhappiness. He thought if we can avoid mental pain, and this is a tough one that a lot of you will connect with, he thought that people unnecessarily suffer from mental pain because of a lot of their thoughts, because of the way they look at things, including the way they look, we look at death. It's better for you to be free of fear, lying upon a pallet, that's like a hard bench, than to have a golden couch and a rich table and be full of trouble. Meaning some people try to acquire lots of possessions and no matter how much they buy, they still have an emptiness. While others who don't chase those material possessions have more time to focus on the valuable things in their mind like honor and soul and things of that ilk. Three mistakes about happiness. And this uh, whole section comes from School of Life, an excellent YouTube um, philosophy primer that I got a lot out of, including the next three mistakes. Epicurus said that we could be happy, but we're always looking in the wrong places. So what's the first problem? First problem is we think we need romantic relationships. Now, this is an odd one because depending where you are in a relationship or not is going to determine at any given time how you feel about this. But if you really examine it, um, happiness in marriage isn't always coexisting. Maybe true love will exist for all of the 53 years of your wedding, but in a lot of cases within how many years are people in separate beds in different sides of the house, if they're even in the same house? He felt that really that's an example of a pleasure. It's a possessive, jealous pleasure, unfortunately, which that pleasure of having that person with you forever is going to lead to pain. He said that this romantic relationship 
leads to oftentimes the possessiveness, the jealousy, the bitterness, and people want this. They search for this. They think somehow that they'll be better off. And you know what? When you're truly in love, there is that period, the honeymoon period, maybe short, maybe long, depending on, on you, that people are engaged in actual happiness. But what Epicurus thought was, friendships is really where it's about. Uh, because in a friendship, it's not as possessive. It's hopefully one person criticizes the other, but it's not criticism. It's constructive always. We're not possessive. It's a different sort of connection. This was also obviously talked about the platonic love of Plato. Of all the means which wisdom acquires to ensure happiness throughout the whole of life, by far the most important is friendship. Friendship is hard to come by. Um, the old line is, if you, can, if you can count your number of friends on two hands, you're a lucky person. Um, you know, a lot of times you have a hard time getting out of one hand of true friends. But the concept of friendship, he thought, was more, more important than romantic relationships because it was a gift that kept on giving. Second mistake. Once again, these are from School of Life. We think that we need lots of money. We're obsessed by our career. We want lots of money. We need lots of applause. We need people to notice us. We need to be important. Well, Epicurus said, you know what? Really what's important in a work situation is to have that connection with others, to actually complete a task, to have achievements. Now, obviously, money is important, but if you, just, if, if you had a job that was meaningless and you just were paid a lot of money, most people would take that. But that's not usually offered. Most of the time, they're low-paying jobs we all have. And a lot of times, if they're meaningless, is that enough? Or do you actually have to use your job to maybe realize your job is your life and make it more worthwhile than just collecting of pieces of paper? Do not spoil what you have by desiring what you have not. Remember that what you now have was once among the things you only hoped for. Uh, I brought a friend once to a concert. They wanted to see the Grateful Dead, uh, which was one of my favorite bands. And they were so excited to go. And I brought him there. And he was just ecstatic. And then he was hoping his favorite song was going to be played. And when the song came on, he was just dancing around. And then like I was dancing around. And then midway through the song, I he was like sit, sitting down and like in tears. And I, you know, I consoled him kind of while dancing and later on when we were discussing I, I asked what that was about and he thought you know I was thinking about what a perfect moment it is was and then I was thinking how more much more perfect it would be if Susie was still here and he ruined a great moment by wishing it was the perfect moment and that's what we often do um, we want you know the enemy is perfect of the good or the good is perfect of the enemy Number three, we put way too much faith in luxury. We want the beautiful stuff. We think somehow, now I'll be honest, if I had that plane and that car and that was my girlfriend, I'd be a happier dude. If I was in tropical vacations, I'd be a happy dude. But does that fix what the problem is? How many celebrities end up having unfortunate, tragic downfalls of drug abuse? They were, had fame, they had money, they had everything but they never had the calm, the peace of mind. That's something that people search for everywhere without realizing it comes from within. When Epicurus talked about through analysis we can learn these things, he said if we can just figure out the reasons why we worry and we can figure out the reasons why we suffer and eliminate them, we're going to be happy. We don't need the riches. More stuff doesn't bring as much peace of mind as you will think. Nothing is enough for the man to whom enough is too little. Now kids a lot of times get kind of annoyed because between Epicurus and Socrates and every Greek and Roman ancient philosopher, they all talk about things like this, which is stop being greedy and materialistic, it doesn't matter. And most kids hear it and it's like water off a duck's back, they don't know what that means. They don't hear it, they just want money, they want bling. They want a nice whip. That means car, I was told. Um, and so that's what they want out of life. And it's hard for them to actually, or for you, the viewer, to actually appreciate that this fact is a fact. Nothing is enough for the man to whom enough is too little. Epicurus is important because if you really look at today with advertising, advertising has confused 
the American public. Now, not everybody watches TV, but a lot of people do. And now advertising is involved via Internet. Most advertising, if you really look at it, talks about the very three things that Epicure said we don't need. First, it talks about romantic love, then money and status, and then material luxuries. If you look at the way advertising works, they link up a shallow, empty thing that you don't need, and then they connect it artificially with something that has no attachment to it. The example is this. You're, you're, you're watching TV, and then all of a sudden, the commercial comes on, and there's six friends and they're all good looking um three men and three girls and they're on a beach and they're by a bonfire and they're throwing a frisbee around and you sit there and you're eating fritos off your chest and you're thinking well i wish i had five other friends in a frisbee i wish i was there and then and they've, they've, they've attracted you and then the ad is for you know you know seven up if you drink seven up you're gonna have five other friends in a frisbee that is not accurate and that connection, that lying to us, is what advertising does. Now, here's a, an ancient advertisement, but apparently, um, if you smoke, face the facts, smoke this type of cigarette, and you will lose 130 pounds and become a hurdler. Now, that's ridiculous. That's toasted. That's ridiculous. But that's the nature of advertising. Examined an ad. I, I saw an ad um, which was classic. It showed, it was a Christmas ad. And at first 30 seconds, we're showing what's really important is family and no waiting in line and the connectedness. And it was so anti-materialist. And then at the end, it was like, and shop at Marshall's. And it was just that connection or that disconnection people don't get. Artificial needs are not needs. The things you really need are few and easy to come by. But the things you can imagine you need are infinite and you will never be satisfied. A little spell check on that, but ultimately we have insatiable wants. We will always want more until we limit it. How to live life. Now, the idea of the golden rule, most people obviously know, do unto others as you would like have done unto you. His version, a little more uh, long in the tooth, the ethic of reciprocity is saying to treat others as you would like to be treated. He actually is one of the first philosophers, not just to write a book about it, but to live by that means. He had a school called The Garden that we'll get to. Um, one of the things he did advise against was marriage. He thought marriage is an obstacle to peace of mind. Um, if you asked a lot of married people, I probably would agree with that concept. Peace of mind, the worrying. Um, that exists in a marriage, the jealousy, the possessiveness, the do you still love me as much, um, et cetera, et cetera. He also believed if you're involved in politics, you're not going to be at peace because you're going to spend all your time trying to get other people to like you, trying to fix things that can't be fixed. Um, he thought that instead of just living a simple life, if what you're looking for is happiness, reaching the highest position or status will not bring you happiness. It will only bring you more stress. So what should you do? He thought, you know what, if you live in society, you probably can't be happy. He said, you know what, you probably need to seclude yourself. Now, there's a lot of other philosophers who talk about this. Thoreau obviously went in the woods, um, the hermits of Taoism, um, and Epicurus is among them. He thought, you don't want to drink, draw a lot of attention to yourself. You don't need lots of wealth and power. Just to learn to enjoy little things. Make it a habit to go outside with a a cup of tea and stare at a flame with the friends that could be fun that should be fun rather than something that requires lots of money Epicurus said the circle of friends is one of the most important ways of having a tranquil life and he said a cheerful poverty is an honorable state meaning you're happy even though you don't have a lot that is his wisdom that he tried to impart the irony of course is he's known for being someone who eat it, ate a lot of great foods here is a picture I found. I did not draw it. I find it amusing. It sort of shows the different levels of Epicurean happiness. Um, you've got the, um, apparently there's no eating of the blueberry pie. That is a bodily desire uh, with these little uh, whipped cream. But they can have lots of those tiny uh, football muffins or whatever that is. They need three additional chairs. Um, but moderation of all things, living a temperate life, meaning not flashy. Um, friendship. The idea of community. If you have these things, you have everything. 
the afterlife. Now, his view on the afterlife is also kind of well known. He said, stop worrying about life after death. Why? Well, death isn't going to hurt because you're not going to exist when you die. Well, hold up a second. There's not going to be any me around to feel the pain if I'm dead. Correct. Well, if in the process of dying you feel pain, that's pain. But actual death, after death, I don't know if it was Epicurus, but someone said in regards to this idea, however, if you're fearful of what it's going to be after death for you, it's probably going to be similar to how it was for you before you were born. He felt, and the Epicureans felt, if you could just stay unconcerned about death, then you could just start enjoying our life. Now, there's a line that says something along the lines of, if you die in the morning, you don't have to die at night. Meaning, if you come to grips with death as a cycle of nature that everything is born dies, if you come to grips with that early in life, then you won't die mentally kicking and screaming and suffering at the end of your life. And so Epicurus, like the Stoics, and also like the Taoists, believe that you need to just enjoy this time while we're here, because specifically, you're not, you don't exist. They were not, obviously, believers in the afterlife. Death does not concern us, because as long as we exist, death is not here, and when it does come, we no longer exist. We have been born once, and there could be no second birth. For all eternity we shall no longer be. But you, although you are not master of tomorrow, you are postponing your happiness. We waste away our lives in delaying, and each of us dies without having enjoyed leisure. Well, think about that. There's a couple different concepts in there. He's obviously saying no second birth, so he's not a believer in reincarnation or heaven. He basically says this is it. And when eternity, we shall no longer be when we die. We're not the master of tomorrow, meaning we're not going to know what's going to happen tomorrow. Why aren't we trying to achieve happiness today? Why, aren't we post why are we postponing it? And then the bottom, we waste away our lives delaying each of us dies without having enjoyed leisure. He's saying kick back and enjoy leisure now. The garden, this was the school he formed 300 years B.C. It wasn't just a school, it was a commune. People live there in isolation. They showed you before the place where you cannot have blueberry pie and there's too few chairs. A bunch of friends. They enjoy the simple things in life. They're not worrying about the rat race. Now, this is the communes that sprung up in the 60s as well. But the idea of Epicurus was doing this 300 years before the birth of Jesus. That's actually the Garden of Epicurus up on a hill. It admitted women and admitted slaves, which are two things that were just unheard of. Think about women got the right to vote in America in the 20th century. This is 300 years B.C. Epicurus, once again, it's about friendship, and his school was about community of friends living together. And we'll wrap up with this quote, which I find very true. It's not so much our friends' help that helps us as is the confident knowledge that they will help us. I hope you enjoyed the Epicurus PowerPoint. Please write some journals.